All right, why don't we uh, why don't we pray and then we'll get going because I've got way more slides than I've got time to get through. So let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, this morning. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for this fellowship. Uh, we thank you for the body, Lord. Um, we thank you for your word, which is truth. And uh, Lord, we just pray that as we examine um, we examine various truth claims, uh, Lord, that we can just hold that up against the truth of your word and be learn uh, and learn how to tell the truth from error, uh, the truth from lies. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give us discerning hearts and discerning minds so that we would be able to be good witnesses in the world, Lord. Um, we thank you for this time. pray that you would uh, anoint this time and help us all to be uh, edified by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, I'm Elder Brewer. That was a Nathaniel joke there. I, need, I don't have a name tag, sorry, or a white shirt. Um, so I, I'm getting to, to back clean up on the Mormonism uh, topics today. Uh, this is probably, of all the, we'll call them cultish groups, the one that I know the most about, uh, followed by Jehovah's Witnesses probably. Uh, I've had many conversations with Mormons at, at our dining room table, and um, just many, many collective hours sat on couches or at tables uh, discussing with, I don't know, probably 20, 30 Mormons at this point. Sometimes they come in pairs, sometimes they bring an elder along, you know, an, an elder being like a, an older, a true elder, an older guy uh, along. Um, anyway, it's been really a, a joy and a tragedy of, of a ministry. Um, it is so sad when you see the look in their eye like they don't have a good response, it seems. And so they bear their testimony to you that they know that the church is true and that Joseph Smith is a true prophet and they get up and leave and you, it just ruins my day, quite frankly, uh, because it's just so tragic to watch. I, they're just deceived. You know, I, that's my firm belief is that they're deceived. Um, they're very earnest, very zealous, very kind people that are simply deceived. And so uh, for... For any that may be watching this video, and I know that there have been several on our previous videos, just know that I, you know, I personally love your community. I love you guys, and I care for you, and that's uh, that's why um, I've spent the time studying uh, Latter-day Saint theology because I truly do love that those people and those com that community. So, anyway, with that, let's get moving. So I want to do a very brief overview of what we've learned in the last two weeks. And the reason I want to do this is because honestly, I think what we've already covered is the most important stuff, right? So we can talk about why they don't drink coffee. We can talk about their temple garments. We can talk about false prophecies of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and all the weird kind of stuff that they taught. But honestly, I think the best place to be is who is God? Who is Jesus? What is the gospel? Like who is God and how do I get to know God? Those are really the questions that are the heart of the matter. Because I know Christians that wear weird underwear too, right? So. We are not going to go into that. I'm moving right along. See, I didn't run this through Melanie. I was, she, she would have probably edited that joke. It's like an unedited sermon. That's right. Um, but so we should focus on the primary issues, right? Who is God? Is God, has God always been God? That's what Psalm 90 verse 2 teaches us. Um, is he the only God? That's what Isaiah 43.10 and Isaiah 44.6 tell us, right? Isaiah 43.10 says, Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Isaiah 44.6, God still speaking says, Is there a God beside me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. So he says he doesn't even know of any other gods, right? Uh, so is that who God is, or is God an exalted man who lives on... Uh, who lives on a planet orbiting the star Kolob. Um, you know, we, we hear from the King Follett Discourse. This is a, a sermon that Joseph Smith gave. He said, we've imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. And then a few sentences later, he says, you need to learn to become gods yourselves the same way that all gods have done before you. Right? That's, this is the teaching. Um, Lorenzo Snow, the quote that Nathaniel's had up the last two weeks, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. This is the belief. This is who God is. Um, who is Jesus? Is he the eternal son of God, as John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Did he create all things? Colossians 1.16. 
right? It says, for by him were all things created, whether uh, in the heavens or on earth, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him and through him. All things hold together, I think. That was a paraphrase. That was the Brett translation. Um, but is that, is that who Jesus is, the creator of all things, including Satan? Or is he a spirit brother of Satan and of us? A spirit offspring of Elohim and one of his wives, just the same as you and I, right? Nice, Sadie. <laughs> Thank you, Sadie, for covering for me. <laughs> um, what is the gospel? Are we saved by grace, through faith, not according to works, lest anyone should boast, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? Or, as 2 Nephi 25, 23 says, are we saved by grace after all we can do? These are the real core issues. And so this is, I, you know, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff today, and it's all good information, and I think it shows that you've done your homework, and it's a way to respect them and what they truly believe, and, or at least what their prophets have taught. Um, bless you. But the core issues are what we just talked about. Who is God? What is the gospel? So let's move on. That was the angel Moroni, by the way. That's who's on all of their temples. Um, is he okay. pointing in a specific direction, right? I think he is. I don't know the answer to that, though. Yeah. All right, so the priesthood. So I'm going to just advance through there. So in LDS theology, the restoration of the priesthood authority is central to their beliefs. So if there was another big topic that wasn't covered in the first two weeks as heavily, this would be the one. Um, so from missionary literature, so I've got my triple here. I think I said I had a quad. I lied. I had a triple. Um, I went looking for it, and I was like, oh, all I've got is the triple. This is something that they might hand you. Uh, there are a couple more pamphlets like this, but these are some things they might hand you. So uh, from this one right here called The Restoration of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, um, let me quote directly from it. It says, quote, The apostles were killed and priesthood authority, including the keys to direct and receive revelation for, from, I'm sorry, for the church, was taken from the earth. So their belief is that when the apostles were killed, so did the priesthood authority leave the earth. Okay? Uh, this, because the priesthood authority was taken away, this is what they believe led to error in the church and ultimately the great apostasy. So in 1829, Joseph Smith re receives the Aaronic priesthood from John the Baptist, and then the Melchizedek priesthood from Peter, James, and John. And so that picture right there is this picture from this piece of literature. So, um, yes, that's, that is what they believe. Is there anything else on there? I don't think so. So what should our response be? Our response, ultimately, our response is that, ultimately, is that the restoration didn't need to happen in the first place. The restoration in and of itself is kind of a farce. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew, um, where do I have that? Matthew 16, 18, it says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jude verse 3 says that we are to contend, earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Our truth, the truth of, of the church has not been lost. The church has not been overcome. The fact that they claim that there's a need for a restoration is altogether baloney. Uh, that is not, that goes against the direct words of Jesus and the rest of the New Testament, quite frankly. But even beyond that, their needs for a priesthood, I think you can answer from scripture as well, specifically the book of Hebrews. Uh, so I want to just read a couple of these uh, verses from Hebrews 7. Um, so here's Hebrews 7, 23 to 25. This talks about the Melchizedek priesthood uh, in particular, which is the higher priesthood as far as they are concerned. So uh, Hebrews 7, 23 to 25 says, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that's Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So in other words, the Bible itself disproves their claim that there's a need for a, a, another priesthood or a, a rest, restored priesthood. The Bible says that we have the priest, the great, the great high priest, that always lives to make the intercession for us, to be that 
bridge between us and the Father, right? Uh, Hebrews 7, 17 says, For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Jesus. There is no need for a Melchizedek priest anymore. Um, and as the higher of the two priesthoods, this really does present a challenge for them. Especially the young men, I feel like, because they, they're the ones are the, that are the holders of this priesthood. So this really is something they've worked toward for their entire Mormon lives, or we'll say uh, their entire religious lives. They've worked toward being able to go to the temple, receive the Melchizedek priesthood, and perform these temple ordinances and these many uh, you know, baptisms and these things. Um, by saying that that is not relevant anymore, that's challenging for them. I shouldn't say not relevant. It's just fulfilled, right? Uh, it is very much relevant. Okay. Any questions on the priesthood? Because we're going to, yeah. Who becomes a priest? I mean, is that every, all young men become a priest eventually? Yeah. They'll all get the Aaronic priesthood around 13, 14 years of age, and that's when they can start handing out the elements for... Confirmation of some sort? Or, uh, yeah, they do. I don't know the details of it necessarily. And then um, once they're about 17, 18, about ready to go on their mission, that's typically when they'll receive the higher priesthood. A lot of religions have the entrance into manhood, except for evangelicals and Presbyterians. That's right. Yeah, and that definitely is kind of their rite of passage, is the receipt of the Melchizedek priesthood. Okay, um, I'm going to enter into a series of slides right now that are going to be kind of rapid fire. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Book of Mormon says. It is largely archaeological type evidence, and I hope that it does two things. I hope it boosts your own faith uh, because we're going to see a lot of confirmation from archaeology about what the claims of the Bible. And I hope it also maybe gives you some, I don't want to say ammunition, but just a little bit more confidence that the Book of Mormon is not the Word of God. Um, ultimately, these I've, I've not had much success using these arguments because the, the, what it usually comes down to is the lack of evidence is not proof of lack of evidence, right? Absen uh, evidence of absence is not, abs I'm sorry, absence of, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? So uh, we just haven't found it yet. That's the argument, right? So, but these are certainly... Too many coincidences that we haven't found yet, I think, to, uh, to really, for that to really hold much water. Most of what I'm going to show right now over the next five to ten slides comes from a documentary that's probably about 30 years old at this point called The Bible versus the Book of Mormon. And it was put together by a small church in Utah that is made up mostly of ex-Mormons. Um, so here we go. So on the left... We're going to say, we're going to, so each slide is going to have a topic. On the left, we're going to have the Bible. On the right, we're going to have the Book of Mormon. So to start here, um, geography. The Bible has maps. The Book of Mormon has no maps. And the reason the Book of Mormon has no maps is because we don't know where it happened. They don't even have a good claim to where it happened. The church doesn't have, as far as I know, an official position on where it happened. All they claim is that it happened in the New World, in the Americas somewhere. Um, but in terms of was that North or South America, Central America, some co combination of the two, excuse me, of the two, we don't know. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's troubling. Um, the Bible has been used multiple times to, to direct archaeological digs, and we found what we expect. The Book of Mormon has done no such thing. Um, even digs that they have tried to make following the Book of Mormon have come up empty-handed and the church has largely stopped doing excavations for that reason. Peoples, people groups. Um, so the Bible. We definitely have evidence of the various uh, cultures in and around Jerusalem, both current and extinct. So you can see here, you know, if you were to go to Israel today, uh, you could see Jewish influence, Assyrian, Babylonian, Greek, Roman influence, in and around Jerusalem. Uh, archaeological evidence of extinct nations. We know that the Canaanites existed. We know that the Philistines existed because there is record that they existed. No such thing in the Book of Mormon. So I highlighted a few things here. Uh, the Jaredite nation is said to, in, they are given the promise in the Book of Ether to become the greatest nation on earth. And here's where it says in Ether 143. Um, it's a long verse. I'm just going to kind of cut it. Well, I'll just read it. Why not? For the sake of context. And there, and there will I bless thee and thy seed and raise up unto me of thy seed 
and of the seed of thy brother, and they who shall go with thee a great nation. And there shall be none greater than the nation which I will raise up, up um, unto me of thy seed upon all the face of the earth. And thus I will do unto thee, because this, t- this long time ye have cried unto me. So that's the promise of the Jaredite nation. They were replaced by the Nephites in roughly 600 BC, uh, who lived in large cities and even said that they built machines. Um, that's in Jerem 1.8. So I'll just read some of this here too. And we multiplied exceedingly and spread upon the face of the land and became exceedingly rich in gold and in silver and in precious things and in fine workmanship of wood, in buildings and in machinery, and also in iron and copper and brass and steel, making all manner of tools and every kind to till the ground and weapons of war, yea. Then the Lamanites um, ultimately conquer the, the Nephites, so that we have these three great nations, the Lamanites being the principal ancestors of the Native Americans is what the Bible, or I'm sorry, what the Book of Mormon teaches. No records exist of any of those three nations. I say either, uh, I mean all, either any of the three. Um, none of those three have any writings, uh, these great cities, these machines, none of it. We've found none of it. Cities. Uh, there are still biblical cities that are called by their biblical names. I put some road signs right there that show Jerusalem, Jericho, and Bet Shean, right? Um, those are modern road signs that exist today, and those are straight out of the Bible. And they are still where they said they were in the Bible. Um, this is a map. I mentioned how the Book of Mormon doesn't have maps. If you look up Book of Mormon map, uh, this was one of the first hits. It's sold by BYU, and they call it a study map. And um, there are more than 30 major cities named in the Book of Mormon, such as Zarahemla, Manti, Sidon, Nephi, Jershon, Bountiful, all in the New World. In the, uh, right around, you know, that four to 600 years around the turn of the millennium there. Um, We found no record that any of them exist. If you were to ask um, archeologists from North America, South America, there's no record that these cities ever existed. What two land masses are those proposed to be? <laughs> Great question. So, so again, we don't know. We don't know where, you know, you can see it's kind of vaguely North America, South America, Central America, vaguely, but the fact is they don't take a position on where it happened. We don't have any good modern landmarks by which to place any of these events. Um, they don't care to really take a, a stance on it, you know? But what's interesting is, is they take a stance on the years these things happen, and if you look at Incas, Mayans, Aztecs, Native Americans, all, all those civilizations were somewhere plugged into these, and none of those civilizations talk about any of these civilizations. 100%. So they yeah. give the years of these times, but none of them match up, so... Yep, that's right. Yep, that's absolutely correct. You know, especially for the Mayans and the Incas, you know, these the Aztecs, these very... Uh, Conquery, you know, the, these very war-minded type of uh, nations, a lot of them, conquering themselves in and throughout, you know, Central and South America. Um, and you see no record of any of these cities that were ever conquered. And we can understand most of their typography at this point, um, if not all of it. And we just, there's simply no record. Flora and fauna, so that would be plants and animals. Uh, in the Bible, this... This one basically boils down to, yeah, we know that stuff that they talk about in the Bible, like figs and almonds and barley, yeah, they grew that in that area at that time. Uh, animals, the animals mentioned there, you know, goats and sheep and uh, that kind of stuff are, yeah, they live there. Um, and some of those animals, like lions, that are mentioned in the Bible, maybe they don't live there today, but we do have records from past explorers that do mention lions in that area. So, uh The Bible, in other words, very, very reliable from a flora and fauna standpoint. Uh, The Book of Mormon, on the other hand, Mosiah 9, talks about wheat and barley. Actually, what we have evidence of in, you know, the B.C. to A.D. AD transition, you know, 600 B.C. to 400 A.D. is squash, beans, corn, you know, the type of things that we associate with the Americas. Um, In in fauna, 1 Nephi 1828, 2 Nephi 12, 7, they both mention large populations of wild horses and donkeys. Yeah. Confused. If the Bible's talking mostly about the Middle East and what's found there, why wouldn't it be normal for the Mormons to talk about the Americas and having different animals and fauna? Because it wasn't there during that time. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, but yeah, what the the Book of Mormon claims that they were growing wheat and barley and these things he, in in the Americas, but they weren't. Uh, yeah, they weren't. No, you're right. They they do mention different things, but they the wrong different things. Um, so you know, if it, books the first couple of books of Nephi mentioned large populations of horses. It's very well documented that horses were not here in the New World until the Spanish brought them. Uh, so certainly not in 600 BC were there horses. And they talk about not just a few horses, but large, large hundreds of thousands of men riding horses into battle. These are large populations of, of horses. So even, even if um, the claim was that they brought some horses with them when they came to the, the New World uh, and they bred for a couple of hundred years. I, I, it's just still, it does not work. Um, there's no way to have that large of a population of horses, and especially for us to have no record of them, not only from a, a written record, but a fossil record. Okay, um, let's move on. Metallurgy and writing. So metallurgy in the Bible, essentially, uh, I didn't write a whole lot about that here. Um, because, again, the types of metals that, that they are said to use in the Bible, we have record of them using in that time period in the, the ancient Near East. Um, but the Book of Mormon, the first Nephi 1825, suggests that the Jaredites and the Nephites used were smelting gold and silver and copper. And that uh, I already mentioned one reference of using steel. That's one of five in the yeah. Book of Mormon. Uh, and this is the Sword of Laman, as they, they call it, which was a steel sword. Uh, they mention, again, large armies using steel weaponry um, in the time, you know, 600 B.C. to 400 A.D. And not only do we not find any of those weapons preserved anywhere, we've dug up precisely zero of them, um, but we find no record of any smelting sites. These are things you can find, too. And uh, there's just no evidence of any of that either. Uh, along the lines of using metals, they were also said to write their records on metal plates, right? So not only are the golden plates that Joseph Smith was uh, allegedly given, you know, metal, um, but they wrote their other records on metallic sheets as well. We've not found any of them. Uh, there's, there's no record of any of those. And you would think that would hold up a heck of a lot better than the 5,500 manuscript pieces and copies that we have of the Greek New Testament, uh, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are from 200 BC. So, I know I'm going really rapid fire here. Does anybody have any questions or anything before I kind of keep going through this? That's P45, by the way. That's a really, uh, really ancient and really important uh, manuscript that we've got. I think it's important to say, this is not Christian archaeologists that are saying this, this is all archaeologists. Yes. This is this is everyone. This is the time of Spanish coming over and conquering the Inca. I mean, it's all of that. I mean, there's, I know Brett said it hasn't been a proof for, for him, and, I'm, and that's, maybe it hasn't, but for me, they, they do exactly what Brett said. They just kind of ignore or gloss over it, because yeah. there is no answer for this. Yeah. And then they always say that the Bible is corrupted and the Book of Mormon is not. And you say, okay, well, then how does the Bible talk about Jericho, the oldest wall city? You know, just all these things that were found over and over and over and over that were in the Bible and everything that's in the Book of Mormon that comes from archaeology yeah. and people groups. I mean, I don't know if you're going to get the DNA of, of the Israelites and things like that. None of that is there. Yeah, I, I, only in the sense that I mentioned that the Lamanites are, are said to be the uh, ancestors of the Native Americans. Uh, there has been DNA work done. Uh, that suggests that that is absolutely not the case. <laughs> that uh, we don't, there is no uh, Hebrew DNA or trace of Hebrew DNA in the Native Americans. Uh, so, and one more strike against it, yeah. They just dismiss it, but what is happening in their mind? Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying that these aren't valuable pieces of information. I think that they don't. I think that they don't know it, uh, or or they're just kind of trained with the yeah. We just haven't found it yet. Right. You know, we just haven't found it yet, um, and they just kind of have a little bit of cognitive dissonance there. I think. Um, yeah, and again, I'm not saying this is not valuable information to have. It certainly is. These can be the pebbles that you toss in their shoe, right? Um, I just don't think these are the key, the core issues, right? Uh, that separate us. That's that's really what I'm getting at. Brett, I think to um, 
sometimes the in LD, in Mormonism, I've seen they uh, just it happens in Christ, among Christians too, where you, people separate their faith from actual reality of life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that there's a tendency to do that within Mormonism, where they say, yeah, no, that's just my faith, that's like my, what guides my life, but you know, it, you know, that's different from my my real like work life and my real. You know, there's a separation there that they kind of grow comfortable with. Yep, so. yep. Uh, there's one more. <clears throat> there's one more piece that I want to talk about here that's not on the slide. In the Book of Mormon, so within the Book of Mormon, there is a book called Mormon, right? Um, so that's that's a like you know, there's a Book of Alma and First Nephi. There's a Book of Mormon in there too. Um, so in Mormon. 932, it states that the, the language that they all wrote in was called Reformed Egyptian Hieroglyphics. Reformed Egyptian Hieroglyphics. And this is what supposedly the Golden Plates were written in, that Joseph Smith translated from. Um, I've never heard anybody say that the Reformed Egyptian is a real language that does exist or ever has existed. Uh, there is no belief by any secular uh, archaeologist or scholar that reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics was a real language. So not only can we not find any of their writings, but they, the language they supposedly wrote in it doesn't have a lot of credibility from a schol scholastic standpoint, unfortunately. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions before I move on? we got a, what, one, two, three, four more slides of this kind of stuff. Okay, coins. Uh, this one's pretty simple. Uh, the Bible talks about using coins, the denarius and all this kind of stuff in the, in the New Testament. This is a picture of a first century Roman coin. Uh, so we have such coins. Uh, in the video that I'm talking about, the Bible versus the Book of Mormon documentary, um, they're just sitting there just digging up a spot and he's just tossing coin after coin after yeah. coin into a bucket. Like there are coins, no joke, like a lot of them. Uh, I, was I talked to the guy at the antiquity shop. I was talking about the coins. I'm like, wow, you have a lot of coins. He goes, we find them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. They're like just. Time they do anything, they find coins. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, I mean, just gently <laughs> scraping at the dirt and just coin, coin. You know, it's, it's remarkable. The Book of Alma describes a use of coinage uh, that they have, metallic coinage as well. And from what we know from archaeology, there was no metallic coinage used in the New World during that time. It was much more of a bartering uh, type of a, a community, and metallic coins were not part of that. There wasn't really a money system uh, the way that we understand it, the way that they would describe it here. Uh, and like I said, the Book of Alma goes into pretty great detail describing their coinage and the way that their, uh, the way that their economy worked. And it was just not, it does not purport doesn't match anything that we understand from the New World. <clears throat> okay, warfare. This is an, we've kind of alluded to this already, uh, and this is pretty simple as well. We find what the Bible describes. We don't find what the Mo Book of Mormon describes. Uh, we even have extra biblical accounts that have been found for the Bible. So, you know, I mentioned here in the second bullet on the left, um, Josephus talks about what happened at Masada. And there was roughly 900 deaths there at Masada. Uh, following Josephus, we were able to not only find Masada, but find the bones of the people that uh, were killed at Masada. Um, we find, we have arrowheads that have a Babylonian design and an Assyrian design and an Israelite design. You know, we have these types of, of evidences for warfare that match what we hear in the Bible. I mentioned already Massive battles that are described in the Book of Mormon. Massive battles. Ether 15, so that's a book within the Book of Mormon again. Ether describes a massive battle with roughly 2 million deaths. 2 million deaths. And then later, in Mormon 8, there's another battle with, if you were to add all the numbers up, 230,000 more deaths. So we're up to two and a quarter million deaths, all in the same region in the Book of Mormon. Again, with horses, steel, armor, and arrows, and weapons, we've never found a single thing. It's all supposed to have happened around what they call the Hill Cumorah, which is in New York. Uh, 
the church owns the Hill Camara, and they have not excavated it. I wonder why. <laughs> you might wonder why. How big is the Hill Camara that can handle two million people? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that big. It's not that big. It's, and it's pretty, and it's just kind of like a mound of dirt. It's not that big. Um, but this is, this, is what is, this is what is taught in the Book of Mormon, uh, is that there was millions of casualties in a single war, a single battle, and yet no evidence has been found. Can you give historical context of some sort, and there's a purpose for sharing this in the Book of Mormon, or is it just... This is our history? Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's part, you know, I mentioned that the Jaredites were overthrown by the Nephites who were overthrown by the Lamanites. It's in these conflicts that they're, part of the yeah, that's kind of what it is. Actually creating the Mormon faith in some sense, or what is the purpose of sharing this? I mean, again, like Nathaniel said a couple weeks ago, if you were to just read the Book of Mormon, just the Book of Mormon in isolation, you wouldn't get to the, to the modern doctrines of the Latter-day Saint faith. So it's so yes in the sense that it's their history they believe. I, the most formative thing about the Book of Mormon, I would say, for their faith is that there is another testament of Jesus, and he came to the Americas, and and you know Jesus had more to say. That's being supported information of some sort. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what Whereas it is. Whereas all the evidence in Scripture of all these occurrences supports the development of doctrinal views and sure. views yep. of God and yeah. what God was doing on earth. Yeah, you know. yeah justice, redemption, yeah. remnant, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. Modern day Hill Camorra, is that referenced in the Mormon literature? <clears throat> I can't remember if they call it the Hill Camorra by name in the Book of Mormon. I don't think they do. I think that's just what has the kind of tradition has passed along as the location of these great battles. That, that might be like a you know ground zero of a map for them if that's a location. Yeah, yeah. The only geographic location that today they ascribe as um, part of their history. Yeah, yeah which again, I believe, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's in upstate New York. It's near Joseph Smith's home. Uh, convenient. Yeah, convenient, <laughs> right? Uh, which you would think would kind of allow you to, you know, 60 miles from, and you know, but they just can't put a map together. It's probably not that important, but who were those two wars supposed to be against? Here, here, I believe that the first one was between the Jaredites and the Nephites, and the second one was between the Nephites and the Lamanites. Uh, don't quote me on that. And if, if anyone from Latter day Saint community is watching this, don't skewer me on that one. I'm, I'm taking my best guess on that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very happy to be corrected on who those wars were between. Okay. And that's not unimportant. It is important. Okay. Temples. So we still, obviously, there is a temple in Jerusalem today. Um, we have, you know, the Western Wall uh, today that I'm showing a picture of there that was built by Herod in Jesus' day. There are Places where there is not one stone laid upon another, as Jesus predicted. Those are stones from, uh, from Herod's temple. Uh, it is very well documented that that's where the temple is and was, right? The Book of Mormon says that they built a temple that was akin to Solomon's in 2 Nephi 5.16. There's no evidence that that temple has ever existed. Um, and I think that we can look at, our, look at the, the temple that is currently in Jerusalem and say, that's pretty, a pretty tall claim to say that there was a, uh, a temple of that magnitude that can go completely hidden from archaeology for two millennia. Uh, also, they have their priests that have been appointed, uh, but it says specifically in the Book of Mormon that those priests are descendants of Joseph, not necessarily descendants of Aaron, which would violate the commands in Leviticus, so I find that a little bit interesting that they would do that. Um, but so they needed somebody to be able to read new reformed reformed Egyptian. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Historical people. Uh, we have a lot of extra biblical references to people in the Bible. Uh, I mentioned David there, Caiaphas, Ezra, Paul, Jesus. That is a stone right there from uh, Taldan uh, that mentions the city of David. Uh, right there we found... Caiaphas's bone box semi recently. If I'm, I think it was Caiaphas, right? Uh, found his bone box semi recently. Um, 
the Book of Mormon, though, for example, well, and obviously tons of extra biblical references to Jesus. That's, that's not even in question, right? Uh, the Book of Mormon, on the other hand, outside of Jesus, um, has no extra biblical reference to anybody. Um, Lehi, Lehi, Nephi, these are, so Lehi was Nephi's father, just for the record. Um, Laman, none of that. The Book of Mormon claims a mass conversion to Christianity when Jesus came in over in 34 AD. We see no record in any of, say, our ancient civilizations, uh, the Inca, the Maya, uh, Aztec, any of that, that there was ever any Christianity in the area. Uh, and not to mention, those civilizations peaked hundreds of years after the, the Nephites were supposedly building large fortified cities with machinery. Um, and yeah, we just don't. The, the timeline does not, does not work out in that regard. Um, any questions on that? Do they have any claim to etymology of some of these names? You know, all the biblical names have rich Hebrew meanings you know, so often, and yet E, I, Nephi just sounds made up. I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, so they don't claim any. I don't, not that I know of. Yeah. Not that I know of. I've never heard anybody. I mean, granted, I don't spend a lot of time talking about this yeah. kind of stuff generally. Uh, you can spend a couple hours talking about the nature of God. <laughs> Um, that I choose not to necessarily go this route most of the time, but um, I've never he heard anybody tell me, yeah, but the richness of, you know, you can see Nehi you know, Lehi way back here, even in the Old Testament, whatever, n uh, n none of that. Well, like you said, the, the languages don't, there's no evidence of even the languages existing. <laughs> right, that's true too. There's more people that speak Elvish today than Reformed yeah. Egyptian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Klingon. Yeah, Klingon. Yeah, you can major in Klingon. <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not publicly, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yep. Okay, so everything that I've gone in this kind of like two-column format has all come from this one documentary. I have that documentary. I can find ways to share it with you guys if you want. Um, obviously, you can have these slides, too. But let's move on. There's a couple of other things I wanted to talk about here. So, I want to move into, I've got two more slides. Do I have time? You got 20 minutes. I got 20 minutes, all right. That's time. So, the Bible gives us two tests of a prophet. Okay, two tests of a prophet. I'm going to read them both really quickly. Uh, I'm actually only going to read the first three verses of Deuteronomy 13, but here we go. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3 says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder... And the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. So if he gives you a prophecy and it comes true, and he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 18.22 says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that word, or that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So those are the two tests of a prophet that the Old Testament gives us that we should subject anybody that claims to be a prophet to. And that includes Jesus, right? We should also hold Jesus to this standard. He would hold himself to it. Joseph Smith not only had multiple false prophecies, um, multiple false prophecies, but as we've learned over the last couple of weeks, he has a very different definition of who God is, so he fails both tests, actually. So I want to give you just a few false prophecies here. Uh, I don't have them on the screen. Um, I can provide this information to you, too, but I'm just going to read off a couple of false prophecies here. In 1835, so five-ish years after the first vision account, uh, Joseph Smith prophesied that the Lord would return within 56 years. This is from the History of the Church, Volume 2, page 182. By 1891, that was proven to be a false prophecy. Uh, in 1843, Joseph Smith prophesied that the United States government would be overthrown and wasted in a few years if they refused to redress the wrongdoings committed against Mormons in Missouri. That's History of the Church, Volume 5, page 394. The U.S. government has never formally redressed any wrongs committed against the Mormons in Missouri, and the government still stands nearly 170 years later. In 1832... 
Uh, so two years after the first vision account, Joseph Smith prophesied that the present generation of Mormons would not pass away before the temple of the New Jerusalem would be built in Zion, Missouri. Uh, that's from Doctrine and Covenants, section 84, which again, that is one of their official Doctrine and Covenants. It's right there. That's one of their uh, holy texts. So from Doctrine and Covenants, section 84, uh, he said that there would be a temple built in Zion, Missouri before the current generation of Mormons passed away. Um, they were forced to flee Missouri, though, as Nathaniel told us about, and no temple was constructed there in Joseph Smith's lifetime or during that generation. In that same year, 1832, Joseph Smith prophesied that the United States Civil War would eventually engulf all nations. That's from Doctrine and Covenants, section 87. This prophecy did not come to pass. That's a small selection of failed prophecies. Yeah. The criteria to be a true prophet is that what you say comes true and you don't lead people to other gods. That's, that's exactly right. Two, two parts. That's exactly right. It's not just if it comes true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Because that's, I, I, lo I love that about the first test of a prophet in Deuteronomy. They say, even if they, what they say comes true, you know, they, it, they grant, okay, maybe it comes true, uh, either by sheer coincidence or some other heavenly force of some kind, um, it comes true. But if they say, let's, let us follow after other gods, it, actually, if you continue on in verses 4 and 5, they say you should stone those guys. Um, I just thought that wasn't necessarily relevant right now. On um, YouTube, there's something called Test of a Prophet. It's an expedition Bible. Uh -huh. Really great. It's a guy that actually does a lot of archaeological in Israel. Yeah. He actually sits down with one of his colleagues who is a, a Mormon. Okay. And they go over all those things, and they talk about through it. It's about an hour and ten minutes, but it's fascinating. Okay. Where he keeps on taking the Bible with the Bo Book of Mormon on top, because obviously they're saying it's that, and then eventually he puts the Bible on top of the Book of Mormon. Like, and, the, and the guy, literally, who's been his whole life, Digging alongside this guy says you're right, and at the very end it says you know he hasn't he hasn't converted, but it's a great, it's fascinating that you want to look at all the archaeological evidence as well as the proof of a prophet all the prophets that have not come to fruition. So yeah, it's about an hour and ten minutes, but it's well worth your time. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to mention that specifically. I didn't know about it actually. So What's thanks. It called, it's called uh, Test of a Prophet, okay. and it's it's Bible um, uh, expedition. Joel Bible. Kramer. Yeah. Okay. Really good. And he's got some other cool stuff just about Christianity too. But and and the, the thing about Latter-day Saint theology and, and just the Latter-day Saint histories and all this is it is, it's honestly so, truth is stranger than fiction, actually, I think, in, in a lot of this. So we could talk, we could do this entire equipping hour class, you know, 10, 12 weeks, however long it's going to be, 15 weeks. We could do it all on Mormonism. We really could. Um, this is scratching the surface in a lot of respects. So, okay, for my last slide here, I want to talk about what I'm calling other curiosities because there are other curiosities here. And Brigham Young said this in Journal of Discourses, and I, I, I vetted each of these references yesterday, just so you know. Journal of Dis and these are all available on the church's website. You can look up Journal of Discourses. It's many, many volumes. It would be impractical to have it in your home, but you can. there's an app with it uh, called the, the Gospel Library. You can download it. It's a memory hog, though. That's why I deleted it off my phone. Um, anyway, Journal of Discourses, volume 13, page 95. Brigham Young says, I have never yet preached a sermon and sent it out to the children of men that they may not call scripture. Let me have the privilege of correcting a sermon, and it is as good scripture as they deserve. So Brigham Young views his sermons as scripture. And he was the president of the church immediately following Joseph Smith, okay? So he has a lot, I mean, obviously Brigham Young University, he has a lot of sway, a lot of impact and influence on <coughs> the Latter-day Saint church. Uh, not as much as Joseph Smith, but they would affirm that he was a prophet of God. They must, it's, they, they, they absolutely must. Here are a couple of really interesting things that just, uh, Brigham Young taught. I'm actually going to start at the bottom because I think this is something we all already know. Um, Journal of Discourses, volume 11, page 269. The only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. So he, this is a large, that section right there, volume 11, page 269, is part of a large section on the benefits of polygamy. Um, and it talks about how there's no way that the, the United States government's going to keep Utah from being a state. 
There's no way that'll happen. And even if they do, who cares? We'll just t- come, come what may. We'll, this is what God has called us to. Okay? We know that they eventually did uh, outlaw polygamy so that they could become a uh, member of the Union of the United States. Uh, but this is what Brigham Young taught, that the only way that you could truly become a god, which, remember, Joseph Smith taught, so this was not Brigham Young making that part up, um, the only way you could become a god is if you were polygamous. Plain and simple. They said, one sec, uh, yeah, one sec. Uh, they said, he, he goes on to say that even if you don't enter polygamy, you might be able to come into communion, maybe occasionally with the Father or with Jesus, but uh, you'll never be able to be a king of kings like you desire to be. Conveniently, the, like the current Latter-day Saints wrote that out and stuff, right? They, they don't practice polygamy. Yeah. Like, the FLDS does. Yes, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, th- those that those that hold to the kind of the yeah, yep. Um, so those yeah, those that are holding on to these early teachings that kind of kind of in a Reformation type of a of an idea, right? Trying to reclaim the the ancient beliefs, right? Uh, there are Mormons today that that hold on to this type of stuff and say our prophets taught this. I don't care if it's not savory to the culture. Our prophets taught this. Yeah. So in Christianity, we would say you can't pick and choose the parts of the Bible that you believe. You got to take it all and, mm-hmm. and believe it. They seem to, like modern day Mormonism. I know several mm-hmm. that aren't polygamists. So do they pick and choose what they want to follow, or are they just not taught mm-hmm. some of this stuff? So here's, here's here's the difference. They believe in modern day revelation. That's really the kicker because their modern-day prophets would say that Joseph Smith was either just speaking as a man or that God has given later revelation that overrides this. So that's, that's their, uh, to say it bluntly, their get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, anything that's kind of unsavory from the past, more modern prophets can come along and say, God has revealed to me polygamy is not acceptable anymore. It was true then, but it's not true now. That's right. That's right. So the last one I want to talk about um, and we'll close here, um, is Adam God doctrine. This is wild, guys. Like, this is wild. So I'm just going to read a little bit more than what's on the slide here. I read this to Melanie last night, and she was just like, what? <laughs> Brigham Young taught this. This is in Journal of Discourses, Volume 1. Volume 1, page 51. 50 and 51. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he, he came into it, I'm going to back up real quick. No modern Mormon believes this. I just want to make that very clear. You cannot and should not hold a modern Mormon to Adam God doctrine. You can point it out to them and say, your prophet taught this. I know you don't believe it. But like, anyway, don't hold them to that in that sense. But I like to put the pressure on a little bit and say, why, why are you okay to just write your prophet off um, in this way? Um, but don't pretend that they all believe that Adam and God are the same. Okay. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Every man upon earth, professing Christians or non-professing, must hear it and will know it sooner or later. Adam is Michael, the archangel, and also is our God and our Father. Ancient of days. The ancient of days. So that is Adam is the ancient of days. A couple of sentences later, we're talking just a couple sentences later, when the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. And who is the Father? He is the first of the human family. Jesus, our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden. And who is our father in heaven? So they, Brigham Young taught that Mary was called the Virgin Mary, but was actually not a virgin in the sense that she was impregnated physically by God the Father, who was Adam. One more quote. One more quote. Now... Let all who may hear these doctrines pause before they make light of them or treat them with indifference, for they will prove their salvation or damnation. 
So Brigham Young said that Adam-God doctrine was so important, it was a salvific issue. Those are some other curiosities. Again, no modern Mormon believes this. Other than... Generally, they shrug their shoulders and say that there's been more modern revelation. We don't believe that. So is the modern revelation recorded? Like, is the Book of Mormon updated every time there's a new revelation? Uh, no. So it would, be, it would go in the Journal of Discourses if it's something that more modern prophets have written. A lot of their uh, teaching kind of comes out in their twice annual um, general conference. Uh, how much of that gets rolled into the, the Journal of Discourses and how long, what the lag time is for that, I actually don't know. So how do they answer the multiple verses in the Bible, including their King James, about not adding or taking away from the Word of God? Um, they would claim that the Bible is corrupt in that regard, that we've actually removed truth from the Bible, and this is simply restoring it. So they turn it back around. Yeah. Who is allowed to do modern-day prophecy? Like, how do they mm -hmm. yeah, choose who is legit? The president of their church, it's not terribly unlike how a new pope is chosen. Um, I don't want to say it's exactly like that, but there's, there's the quorum of 12 apostles that is kind of the, the next higher level authority, and generally one of those 12 will, will come up and be the, uh, the next president of the church. Yeah. The, president the, the, the president is the prophet. The president is the prophet. Is Mitt Romney in the big, in the apostolic sort of you know, oh, yeah. presence of some sort. Of, in what sense? He's not well, a Mormon. He's a, is, yeah, he's a yeah, he's a Mormon. Yeah. Well, I don't think he's part of the church. 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 No. no, I don't think he's in the church leadership at all. You say, oh, you're talking about the. Yeah, no, no, he's not. What like, is the conferences? Do they just like update like theology and stuff during those, or do they like talk like? I, so it, they're so they're generally you can watch them. They're free to watch. Um, they're generally just. Nice little sermons. I hear they're really long and boring. They, yeah, they are. But in, in <laughs> I, I mean, in isolation, each one is, you know, maybe 30 minutes or something. It's like a little sermon. Um, they're pretty topical. They're not expositional preaching or anything like that. They're just kind of, you know, sp some speeches, if you will, from the church leadership in order to encourage the body. They usually also announce new temples to be built during that time which is their way of trying to indicate the spread of the church and the need for more temples and look how much we're growing. Um, so, yeah. Are they growing? I think the, the back door is as big as the front door. Okay. Yeah. yeah so uh, there's a, there's a, there, it is a survey in 2020 called the U.S. Religion Survey. You can find it online. Um, and it shows that 24% of Latter-day Saints that they, that they put in the survey were actually questioning their faith. Um, so, uh, as opposed to uh, basically uh, conservative Protestant, Protestant, Protestant system. Yes, I got gotcha. you. Got me? You with yeah, me? Gotcha. Okay. Uh, which was around 10%. So, 24% oh, okay. uh, is a pretty significant it difference, yeah, uh, which important. should give us hope as we as we talk to people about truth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. One last question. I have a very scientific theory. The eyes of Mormons look different to me. It is just a weird thing to do. There's a glazed over, slightly squid looking Brigham Young. I know that's very scientific, but I don't know if anybody else has observed that. But it's almost this slightly closed look. Well, there were I, I, there were many years when Utah led the nation in suicides because it is a very oppressive religion. So there is a spiritual and and actually I, I I've heard and I haven't vetted this recently, but I've heard that actually uh, Latter-day Saint women have the highest percentage of antidepressant use, uh, just because it is an oppressive, it's an oppressive religion, and there's this dependence upon their husbands, right, uh, uh, to, to resurrect them, to bring them into glory. Um, one positive, Ew, oh God, one positive aspect, which I find fascinating from a linguistic point of view, Salt Lake City, Utah is the number one city in the world where the most languages are spoken. Huh. Really? Interesting. Hey, I want to let um, I want to let Nathaniel speak to these. He hasn't had a chance to share them yet. I haven't read any of these books, so they may all be awful. I don't know. <laughs> these are some books you can read for further reading and going left to right. 
they're going increasing in uh, complexity. So if you want something really simple to read on this, this one right here, Sharing Christ with Your Mormon Friends by Carrie Trevanovich, is less than, a hundred, it's like 100 pages, very easy read, simple, understandable. If you want to move up a notch, this is written by Mark Ayers. He's an ex-Mormon, and he speaks to things that Mormons uh, actually are dealing with and care about the things on their hearts and on their souls that would actually speak to them. Moving up a notch, this is written by multiple authors um, that each have different uh, ideas about how to address Mormons and speak to them, and really helpful book. And then finally, The New Mormon Challenge. This is the most um, sophisticated response to Mormonism that's been written in the past 20 years. It's uh, it's, it's not light reading, so that's something to, to know about that one, okay? So. Cool. Um, I've also read, there's a book called uh, Questions Mormons Should Be Answering, and another one called Answering Mormons Questions, um, that were both very helpful in, in my learning. I can't remember the authors of those books, unfortunately. Bill McKeever, I think, wrote one of them. Um, I can't remember the other, though. So there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, material out there for this particular topic. Any final questions before we pray? Yeah. What are we doing next? <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses! <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, let's, let's pray. I'll be up here. I'm happy to, happy to talk more. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your grace in our lives to show us the truth. We thank you, Lord, that your scripture, your, your word, your, the Bible is, is clear that it is accurate, that it has been transmitted to us faithfully over the generations, Lord, that you have preserved your word faithfully for us, the church. We thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, that as we look to these, uh, these false religions, these religions that seem so similar uh, in so many ways to our faith, um, I just pray, Lord, that you would give us compassionate hearts. I pray that you would help us to, to look upon those that have been deceived with compassion and just extend a hand and, and offer to bring them truth. Um, I pray that you would work in the lives of those um, Latter-day Saints that may come to our door next. I pray that you would give us boldness to, in order to speak to them uh, clearly about the gospel and who you are. Um, and I pray, Lord, that you would, again, soften the hearts of those young men and women that are coming, knocking on the door, um, that you may, um, through us even, as instruments of your mercy, bring them into the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.